At the start of this new year, your finances might be such that you haven't given much thought to any investments that you plan to make this year. That would be perfectly understandable. And yet this evening, I want to encourage you to make an investment if you haven't already made it. And if you have made it, then to see it as the best investment of your life. You see, between the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and his coming again in glory, you are to invest in the loss that is gain. You are to invest in the loss that is yet gain. That sounds like a bit of a riddle this evening, doesn't it? Let me say it again. Between the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago and his coming again, what are we to do? We are to invest in the loss which is gain. And that investment in loss which is gain must be the right conclusion to draw from the verses we're going to consider this evening in Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, Verses 34 to 38. Verses 34 to 38. Where Jesus spells out to his disciples what the cost of discipleship is. What it costs to be a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me quickly and briefly say that it's not the only place in the Bible where Jesus speaks like this. On another occasion, he says, and I quote from Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, listen, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus spells out grounds by which we cannot be his disciple. He goes on to say, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In the same chapter in Luke, he says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Couldn't be clearer. So we might turn around and say, well, does that mean that I can't follow Jesus as I want to, making up my own rules? No, you can't. So poor old Jesus isn't so desperate for people to follow him that he'll take them as his disciples on any terms, lowering the entrance requirements and having a, a New Year's sale. No, he won't. He won't. Well, in that case, I'd better take a sober look, hadn't I, at what he does actually say. Yes, you should, and so should I, and so should we. The teaching here about the cost of discipleship comes at a place in Mark's Gospel where we've just reached the climax, the high point of the first half of the Gospel. Because one of his followers, a man named Simon Peter, has become the first disciple to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. For generations, God had promised that he would send a specially anointed king who they knew of as Messiah. And Simon Peter is the first one to recognize that this Jesus of Nazareth is the one who's been long promised and has been long awaited. And last Sunday, we looked together at that, that confession that Simon Peter makes. Jesus said in the question which Arthur read out for us earlier on, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter is the first character in the Bible to say, you, you're the Christ. You're the long-awaited one. You are he. The kingdom has come because the king has come. And he made that confession. And last Sunday we saw three things. That confession of faith was born of an understanding and acceptance of the evidence that Peter had seen and heard Christ perform and teach. 
He believed it. It was real. Secondly, that confession of Simon Peter's was in great contrast to what others were saying about Jesus of Nazareth. Some, as we've had in our reading tonight, were saying he was Elijah. Others, another prophet. Some were saying he was John the Baptist back from the dead. But in contrast to that, Simon Peter says, no, no, you're the Christ. You're the one. And the third thing we saw last Sunday was that this confession by Simon Peter wasn't because he was cleverer than the others, but was a miracle. A miracle takes place if any one of us comes to see and believe who Jesus Christ really is. We only come to confess him as Christ and Lord by a supernatural working of Almighty God in our lives. And Mark, in his Gospel account, has been very keen to point that out to us, which is why, in recent weeks, we've seen those two miracles that Jesus performed of revelation. First of all, there's a deaf mute, and Jesus heals him. He's able to speak and to hear. And that's a picture of what it is to come to be a real Christian. Our eyes are opened, our ears are unstopped, and we hear the voice of Jesus speaking to us through the Bible. And the second miracle that we've seen that Mark has recorded in this section is of the blind man who sees. But this miracle of Jesus is uniquely in two stages. First of all, when the man's eyes are open, Jesus says, what do you see? And he says, well, I see men, but they're walking like trees. So he sees something, but he's not seen everything. And so Jesus touches him again, and he sees everything perfectly. And that miracle is to emphasize to us what's taking place in the life of Simon Peter. He's come to see who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. But he's still seeing quite blurrily. He hasn't understood what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. So we're going to look tonight at the cost of discipleship, but it comes after that first confession by a disciple that Jesus is the Christ. And what we notice here is that this confession is the cue for Jesus now to speak openly about what sort of Messiah he is, what that really means for him. And as we continue going through Mark, we're going to notice that he does this on another two occasions. We're entering now, really, into a couple of chapters which set out the whole pattern of the king, Jesus, the king's suffering service. That's what we're going to be seeing over the next few weeks. And just notice that their book ended, the beginning and end, by miracles of revelation. The two I've just mentioned, when we get to the end of the suffering service, we find the blind man, Bartimaeus, being given sight. It's another miracle of revelation. But what Jesus does here is he takes this cue, this confession, to then speak to his disciples about what his ministry is all about. And the problem I have and you have this evening is that it's almost impossible for us to grasp the shock factor of what Jesus now goes on to say. He goes on to talk about the fact that he's going to suffer and die. And living 2,000 years after the event, we would say, well, what's the shock that Jesus dies? Everybody knows that Jesus dies. Well, that's because we live 2,000 years after the event. It blew the minds of the Jews. Messiah going to die? That's ridiculous. That can't be right. Why did they think like that? Well, because they had in their own minds a very wrong idea of what Messiah was going to do. The Jews were expecting Messiah to be a, a military leader or a political leader, an economic freedom fighter who was going to set them free from the oppressive rule of the Romans. That's what they were expecting the Messiah to come and do. And of course, that tied in with the very next words that Jesus says because he describes himself as the Son of Man. Well, the Son of Man is a character that we read of in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 13. 
And this one spoken of in the Old Testament was going to be given an everlasting kingdom, an everlasting glory, an everlasting dominion. All nations and languages were going to bow down and serve this Son of Man. And so when Jesus starts saying, well, the Son of Man, they must be thinking, well, he is the Son of Man. He's going to have this great and glorious power and authority which is going to set us free from the Romans. But that's not how Jesus finished the sentence, is it? Jesus says, the Son of Man, what? Well, he says five things. First of all, he says that something must happen to him of necessity. It's part of God's plan that the Christ, the Son of Man, should experience certain things. Well, what must happen to him? Must he conquer bravely against the Romans? No, no, Jesus says four things now. He must suffer many things. No, no, our Messiah's not going to suffer. Yes, he is, Jesus says. Suffer many things and be rejected by... Well, who's going to reject Messiah? Or it must be the really evil people in the world who are going to reject him. No, no, says Jesus. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the respectable religious leaders of the day. The elders, the chief priests, the scribes. Mm. Well, what's his degree of suffering going to be. He must be killed, Jesus says, and then rise again. We completely miss the shock value of that to Simon Peter and the others. To their hearing, that was absolutely scandalous, ridiculous. I mean, Jesus is speaking of his character from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, but he's giving an interpretation of that character that we find in Isaiah chapter 53, who's going to be wounded and suffer and cut off. Could that picture of the suffering servant really be a picture of Messiah? And we pick up something of the shock by Peter's strong negative response to what the Lord's just said to him. When Jesus says to him, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the religious leaders and, and die and rise again, Peter takes it upon himself to take Jesus to one side. I need to have a word with you. I'm going to rebuke you. What you're saying is just nonsense. I refuse to accept what you have just said. To my ears, it's ridiculous. That's giving us a little entrance into how shocking it sounded to Peter. What perhaps is even more shocking is the even stronger response then from Jesus to Simon Peter. He rebukes Simon Peter, the first disciple to recognise who he is. And it's quite a brutal scolding, really. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan? The devil? He says, you're not mindful, Simon Peter, the things of God. You're only mindful of earthly things, the things of men. And you're thinking, well, that soon blew up, didn't it? I thought it was all going very well at verse 29. You are the Christ. And now look at it. It's all got out of hand. It's got out of hand because Jesus is now outlining the nature of his messiahship. Why he came to earth from heaven. What his ministry was all about. And what he's going on to say in verses 34 to 38 is that the nature of true discipleship is shaped by the nature of true messiahship. The true messiahship is going to suffer and die and that pattern is going to shape the lives of true disciples of Jesus. And so we'll look this evening, verses 34 to 38, where Jesus sets out three things that are demanded of true faith and gives us three reasons to persuade us why we are to do what Jesus tells us to do. Three demands, three very persuasive reasons. First of all, Jesus sets out three things that are demanded notice of whoever 
whoever desires to follow him. Notice that word, whoever. There's only one standard of discipleship. Whoever desires to follow him must, one, two, three. Notice, secondly, that discipleship is a matter of desire and the will. Whoever desires to follow him. And the will involves purpose and determination. And so Jesus sets those three things out and he follows them with three persuasive reasons why you and I should follow in the manner which he demands, which is what true faith involves. And yes, it's a real challenge. There's no easy believism in the Bible. There's no kind of fire insurance Christianity. Well, I'll, I'll say I'm a Christian just in case it's all true at the end. I don't want to go to the place of fire. No, no, there's no place in the Bible for simply fire insurance Christianity. And yet I would say that in these challenging words, there's something of the glory and the beauty of the gospel which perhaps we don't see elsewhere. Something that's gloriously encouraging. So let's see these things. The three demands. Jesus says, firstly, let him or her do what? Deny himself. Whoever desires to follow me must deny himself. Deny myself. Wow, that's completely countercultural today and alien, isn't it? I mean, today, you don't deny yourself anything. You're encouraged to be whatever you can be, to assert your rights. I mean, to be honest, if you want to get on in this world, you've got to be self-serving and self-advancing and self-promoting. It's better to do that in a kind of sophisticated way so people don't notice it so much. But you know, that's what you've got to be and do underneath it all. And Jesus says, no, you've got to deny yourself. Yeah, but the world's screaming at me to be self-satisfying and self-fulfilling. And if you're honest tonight, you will say, you know, I, I recognize myself in these words. I might be sophisticated, but boy, I don't have to do a lot for my own reputation. Oh, I don't have to do a lot so that people would think more of me. In fact, when I think about it, you know, the very best things that I do, the very best prayers that I pray, oh, even they are tainted by self and my selfish motives. True discipleship is a radical reversal of how the world tells us to live. We're to deny. It's a very strong word. It means renounce, abandon, refuse to associate with or disown. And what Jesus is saying, you are to deny self, disown self, abandon self, refuse to associate with self. What does he mean by that? Well, self in terms of our own self-centered interests. Self in terms of our own self-centered agenda. Self as us cockily and proudly being the center of our own lives. No, no, no. God and his way is to be center of our lives. Jesus says he must, first of all, deny himself. Secondly, he says he must take up his cross. So if I'm going to be a true disciple of Jesus, I've got to deny myself, and secondly, I've got to take up my cross. Now, when Jesus says that, that's not a general reference to our troubles. You know, we like to be full of self-pity, don't we, and talk to people, oh, if you knew the crosses that I've got to bear. Oh, if you knew what my lecturer was like at college. If you knew what my boss was like. If you knew what my spouse was like behind closed doors. If you knew what my neighbor was like. Oh, I have a cross to bear. That's not what Jesus is speaking about here. In the circumstances in which he spoke, when he spoke about taking up your cross, one thing, one thing would have been understood by his hearers. To carry your cross meant that you were going to execution. You were going to a scene to be dominated by death. If you were carrying your cross, you were a condemned criminal. Life as it had been up to now was about to be completely over in death. 
you were about to face a horrible, painful, repugnant, shameful death on a piece of terror apparatus in a cruel cross. Now, carrying a cross means, for us metaphorically, humble submission. It means that we are going to submit to rejection and scorn and ridicule as we give our complete, entire, utter allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we give to him exclusive service, even if it means physical death for us, as it does for many Christians around the world today. Jesus is speaking of us needing to be ready for a daily crucifixion. A daily ongoing death to self and its sinful desires. It's rising within us to gain mastery over us. We're to bear the shame and reproach and embarrassment from others because we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regarding our lives, our life up to the moment we become a Christian is now over. Life as it once was is gone. Number one, deny yourself. Number two, take up your cross. Thirdly, follow me, he says. That simply means be my companion, be united to me through faith, be at one with me, go the same way with me. And he's just said that he's going to a cross. It's clear, isn't it? It's challenging. And yet there's something glorious about it. You cannot be my disciple unless you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Whoever desires to be my disciple, let him or her deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And at that moment we're thinking, I'm not sure that I want to make this investment at the moment. Well, please listen to the magnificent words that Jesus now says. Because he gives three very persuasive arguments. We're to think about what it is that he who is truth has said, and then think in the light of spiritual reality and eternity... When you can almost hear the Saviour saying, well, if you do that, you know that it makes sense. You know that it makes sense. These are the three reasons that he gives. Number one, verse 35. If you, on the other hand, desire to save your life. If you desire to save your life. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, in the context he means... If you choose to say no to self-denial, if you choose to say no to God only, ever, or first, and live primarily for yourself to promote your own glory and reputation and live for your own wisdom, saying no to Christ and his lordship, no to cross-bearing, if, if you do that, you will perish, he says. The life that you thought you'd saved here in this world will be lost for an eternity to eternal condemnation. If you desire to save your life, saying no to Christ, then your soul will be lost eternally in a place where the fire never goes out. You'll you'll spend an eternity being punished for your sins against God. But, Jesus says, If, on the other hand, you say yes to denying self and taking up your cross and following him for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of the gospel, as we heard in our reading tonight, do you know what will happen to you if you say yes? If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him with all your heart, you will have eternal life. That means that from the very moment you come and trust in him, you, in your life, will suddenly come to know experience, follow, enjoy, glorify the invisible living God. 
you'll come to know the gladness and the joy that we heard of in this morning's message from Psalm 4. If you lose your life for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel, you will know an eternal bliss beginning now and then never ending. A never ending bliss of joy and fellowship with God. You will know him personally. You will live with him. You will enjoy him. You will glorify him. There will be for you no more death, no more tears, no more pain, no more sadness. You see, in this sense, the life must be lost, given away, in order to be saved. Saved by Christ. To be one of his people. The life must be willingly surrendered entirely to the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be wholly submitted to him, denying self, taking up the cross, following him. Only through that willingness to surrender our life entirely to Jesus will we ever gain it. We gain it by giving it away, by losing it, by entrusting it to him in a sense. He wants us to think. Who do you say that he is? Have you seen the nature of his ministry? Do you desire to be his disciple? Ready to deny self, take up my cross, follow him. But if I do, eternal life. If I don't, eternal condemnation. Hmm. So does my worldly gain, do I could gain here? Or does everlasting life in its fullness? Which is it going to be? Secondly, in verse 36, he goes on more, talking about weighing up and evaluating the two outcomes. He says, if you fulfill all your self-centered interests and ambitions, if you live your way, if you gain everything you wanted for your own glory, reputation, wealth, success, fulfillment, satisfaction, well, then he says, in a sense, you'll have gained the whole world. How very impressive. But on the other side of the scales, you will have lost your soul. You will not have glorified the God who made you in life or in death or in eternity. You won't have come to know him and to enjoy him. And that's the purpose for which he made you, to know him and to enjoy him. It's the greatest joy any one of us can ever experience in life. You can gain the world, all the reputation, all the success, all the wealth, but have a life devoid of ever knowing and enjoying the living God. And if that's you, you will perish eternally with a weeping and gnashing of teeth in a place where the fire never goes out. Which is it to be, Jesus says. Eternity is a very long time. I have an illustration about eternity. And we haven't got time for it tonight. Because it lasts for eternity. But eternity never ends. Which is it going to be? He goes on, verse 37, to say, if you say no to him now, then on the day of judgment, when you stand before Christ... What will you then offer him from the whole world that you gained in exchange for your soul? If you think, I want my cake and I want to eat it, I want to live for myself and my pleasures, but I don't want to go to that place of fire. Okay, well on that day when you meet him then, from what you gain from eating your cake, what are you going to offer him in exchange for your soul? That you might, as it were, have it back and go and live with him in bliss forever. What will you give him? What will you exchange? And the answer is that, listen, none of it, none of it will be sufficient. Not your reputation, not your possessions, not your moral uprightness, not your religious pedigree, None is enough for your soul. 
every single thing that you've gained will be useless for an eternity. You will perish. Is it worth it in the scales? You see, you could tonight be making a very poor valuation of your own precious, eternal soul. The third reason Jesus gives in verse 38 is that if in this generation, he says, which he describes as sinful and adulterous, not giving its loyalty and its love to God, but to other things, he says, if in this generation you are ashamed of Jesus and have been publicly loyal to him, then understand that when he comes at the end of time, he will be ashamed of you. And your shame will be eternal. If you're ashamed of him now, when he comes, he'll be ashamed of you. Three demands. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Three reasons. To, not to desire to save our lives, but to lose it. To think about what would it profit us if we gained the whole world and lost our soul? What would we then give in exchange for our soul? And if I'm ashamed of him now, he'll be ashamed of me then. The famous missionary by the name of Jim Elliot said these words, He is no fool who gives away what he can't keep to gain that which he cannot lose. You're not a fool tonight to give away what you can't keep for an eternity. To gain that which you can't lose for an eternity if you receive it, eternal life. And that's why as we come to the table tonight, I want you to leave you with these thoughts. Three of them. One. You know, the Christ who said these words, first of all, he did suffer many things. He was rejected by the respectable religious leaders. He was killed upon a cross. And he did, on the third day, rise again. You see, his words are true. So we need to listen to them and believe them. Secondly, it's also evident from this passage that a couple of things. One, he will come again. We haven't seen the last of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read here, he will come again in the glory of the Father with his holy angels. The Bible teaches in the Christian belief that Jesus Christ is in heaven and one day he's going to return to earth for the final judgment of the last day. It's make mind up time. And why Arthur read chapter 9 and verse 1 tonight was that it's there made clear that during the lifetime of the people spoken to by Jesus, the kingdom of God was going to be present with power. Some of you here aren't going to die until you see the kingdom of God present with power. And many of us think that's an allusion to what we next come on to in Mark's Gospel, which is the transfiguration when our Lord Jesus Christ is seen in all of his glory. Another think it's a general reference to his death and resurrection, when the kingdom of God was going to be very obviously present with power. So he's coming again, and there's going to be a real glory. Something that's seen both in the transfiguration and in his death and resurrection. But finally, what will you give in exchange for your soul tonight? Your soul, not the person next to you, in front of you, behind you. A soul that, like my soul, is by nature part of an adulterous and sinful generation. A soul that, according to Jesus, is by nature a rebellious soul against him. A soul that breaks God's commandments, that shows him contempt and denial and defiance. A soul that deserves to face the flames. What will you give in exchange for your soul? If you live for self, saying no to Christ and gaining the whole world... 
What you've gained, you won't be able to keep. And what you've gained won't be sufficient to give in exchange for your soul. You will perish. Never once having known, glorified and enjoyed the God who made you and loves you and made you to know him and enjoy him and glorify him, you will die never having done any of those things. But Christ, who is no one less than God in the flesh, unlike you and me, was a sinless, without sin, wholly obedient, suffering servant. And the Bible says that he has so loved you and that he has put such a different valuation on your soul from the one that you have that to free you from sin and Satan and death and condemnation and to secure for you the bliss of eternal life he has given something in exchange for your soul. Something that alone can restore you to eternal life. Which can forgive you your every sin and reconcile you once and for all to God. What's he given? Well, he has denied himself for you. And he's taken up his cross for you. And he was nailed to it, hung on it, bled on it, died on it in your place to bear your sin and face God's wrath. He gave himself as a sacrifice for your sin. And today he calls you to humble yourself, to turn from your sin, your unbelief and any reliance on what you think is your goodness to follow him. Between his death and his coming again in glory, please invest in the loss which is gained. Gaining the greatest gift known to the human race, eternal life. A gain which you can then never, ever lose. What will you do? He is no fool who gives what he can't keep to gain the greatest gift, which he then cannot lose.